Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Thomas, and I will be your mistress of ceremonies this evening. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to the first Science on Tap of 2023. And uh, we were just chatting beforehand, and I don't know if you all know this, but we've been doing this for quite a long time. I think um, we're 15 years total past on doing these events uh, under different names, but um, we're glad to be back, glad to be here this evening to talk about Koala, A Natural History and an Uncertain Future. I have a copy of the book here, and um, our speaker tonight is Danielle Claude. Um, the book just came out today, and so uh, you can can get it and uh, read the book here shortly. Um, but Danielle is going to give us a lot of really interesting information this evening about koalas. And um, just so you know who our speaker is this evening, she is an Australian biologist and award-winning author. Um, her books include Killers in Eden, Voyages to the South Seas, and The Wasp and the Orchid. And she lives in the Adelaide Hills in South Australia and is coming to us from the future. It's uh, I think she said it was 1.30 in the afternoon on Wednesday. So this is officially the farthest away we've had any of our Science on Tap speakers. So very pleased to have her here. I'll be uh, bring her on screen here in just a moment. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, those of you who have been uh, coming to our shows for a while, you'll know that we have a partnership with Broadway Books, and they offer our books at a 15% discount. If you use the code KOALAS15 between now and uh, January 24th, you can get the 15% off and they'll ship that book to you or you can pick it up if you are in Portland. So encourage you to check that out and pick up a copy of the book. Um, Many of you are uh, have been with us for a while, but for, uh, for anybody who is new to Science on Tap, um, we are an event series based in Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington. And our goal is to make science fun, accessible and meaningful, especially for adults. And uh, we are still doing online events, obviously, but we are also back in theaters. And our next event is going to be at the Kiggins Theater, I think next week. And we have a bunch of new shows coming up on the calendar. So please check out our website for more information. Oops, I meant to, let me go back. Um, just briefly, if you have missed some of our online shows, please check out our YouTube channel. We have recordings of many of those. Uh, we are trying to record the, the uh, in-person shows as well. That might be a little sketchy, but we do have some really great topics from the past. So please go check that out. And this event will also be on our YouTube channel soon. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, welcome our speaker this evening. Again, our speaker is author and biologist Danielle Claude. So please welcome Danielle to the stage. Yay. Thank you, Amanda. It's lovely to be here and I'm, I'm very delighted to be um, your first Australian speaker. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you all from Paramankangana country in the Adelaide Hills and it's really in relevant for me to um, acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land I'm coming from because um, Indigenous people have had a really strong connection with country and, and um, a particular relationship with koalas, which has been quite important for um, how I think about koalas and, you know, how I'm going to talk to you today. Um, indigenous stories in Australia are some of the oldest known um, dated stories, if you like. Um, they're incredibly old because we have some significant geological events that we know happened seven or 8,000 years ago and they're reflected in the oral stories that are still being told today. So they're amazingly old. And the interesting thing about those um, oral stories is that they often document sea level rise on the east coast of Australia, which is where a lot of koalas are. And those stories tell us that the koalas were really important to Indigenous people in helping them cope with that environmental change. So the way dreaming stories work um, in Indigenous culture is often about helping us to understand and cope with times of um, imbalance and change uh, and inv significant environmental change. And, and that's really interesting in terms of how it pans out with the koalas helping. So the, the, the message from koalas, I guess, is um, that is, is an instruction to listen to country and listen to what the environment's telling you. And there's a lot, often stories from Indigenous people about um, when they're walking through country, uh, they come across a koala and they will um, stop and listen and, and, 
have a conversation with the koala, ask its advice. Um, and I think that's actually really good advice for us at the moment in a time of great environmental change is to slow down, pay attention to the environment and see what the koalas have to say to us because I think they've got an important message. Okay, well, um, perhaps we can start the slides now and um, we can we can crack off. Actually, if we can just move, I think we're ready to move into the second slide if we can. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a little bit more background about where I come from. I actually, since this is about um, the importance of science, I should probably share with you that I actually started out my university education as an art student. Uh, and the reason for that was like a lot of, lot of um, young girls in particular, um, I thought I was no good at science and no good at maths, and so I couldn't do science. So I enrolled in an arts degree. Um, and fortunately, though, I chose to do psychology, which turned out to be um, a very, rather a mixed scientific degree. Um, so it introduced me to a lot of scientific concepts, forced me to learn statistics, which meant that I had to master some maths, which was good for me. Um, and I focused on animal behaviour in that. So I kind of moved gradually through my academic career from psychology, from arts to psychology to animal behaviour, and then into conservation biology. So by the time I came to do my PhD in Oxford, um, I was in the sciences and doing conservation biology. So, so that's how I ended up being a science writer. Um, I guess there's still a little bit of arts left in me, but I'm very definitely a, a scientist by a way of thought. Um, I, I think science is an amazing way of thinking about the world and, and understanding it. So all of my books have a really strong environmental theme. Um, they are all um, about either nature, past or present. So I write quite a few kids' books about um, Australia's prehistoric fauna. Um, I often write about museums and natural history collections, and I often write about um, naturalists and scientists. So, you know, I've got a couple of biographies as well talking about naturalists. But Koala is really the first book that I've really come back to um, to my starting point, as it were, coming back to mammal mammal behavior which is which is what I did my PhD on I, I actually studied um, American mink but in Scotland so <laughs> very much a, a multicultural cross-continental researcher I guess you could say so koala's coming back um, to my roots which has been great it's been really, really I mean I really I mean, humans are great but I really really like writing about animals and it's lovely just to be able to focus primarily on animals and that's the tack, uh, tack I've tried to take with koala is to try and tell that story not from a human perspective. I really wanted humans to come last in this story. <laughs> and in that sense, that's why I've, I've started the book at the very beginning of the koala story with their, with their evolution and their fossil history so that we can come all the way through that evolutionary history and really understand where they've come from, not just... What, where they are now but, and, and in that way try and understand how they've ended up where they are and what, what their needs are into the future. Okay, so uh, if we can go to the next slide. We've just got, um, I guess, you know, why, why koalas is one question people often ask me. Um, koalas, I mean, apart from the fact that they're extraordinarily cute, you've got to admit there's something amazingly cute about koalas. Um, they're just a perfect pitch postcard, fluffy animal. They remind us very much of teddy bears, um, which is why people call them koala bears. But, um, you know, they've got that forward-facing face and those eyes have got a face that we really connect to, that as humans we, we are primed neurologically to, to respond to faces like our own and like koalas. So um, they're very, very appealing animals. You know, they baby koalas, if they're upset, they lift their arms up as if they want to be hugged. Um, so they trigger all our primate um, responses. But I think the particular reason for me, I guess, I guess a lot of Australians, you know, we know, you know, there's koalas around. We don't pay them much attention. They're actually quite hard to see in the wild. So a lot of Australians would never have seen one in the wild, although they, they know what they look like. Um, 
But I think that bushfires recently in Australia have had a really big impact on how we see koalas. Um, and certainly for me, I had I live in a bushfire area in the Adelaide Hills. It's very flammable here. Um, and we had a bushfire a couple of years ago that burnt right up to through a big conservation reserve behind my house, um, right up to the edge of my fence line. So that had a big impact on the on the local community. Um, and obviously had a massive impact on the conservation park and all the koalas that lived in it. So I guess that really triggered my my interest, particularly was that, you know, realising how vulnerable they are to bushfires um, and how easy it is for them to disappear um, in, in the event of these fires. And I guess, you know, we, we had, as a, as a backdrop to that, we had also had all the fires on the east coast. So we had the, um, the the black summer bushfires that burnt all up the east coast. And through that whole east coast process, um, we were being told that you know the koalas were going extinct, that they were disappearing, that they were vanishing, that that these koala populations on the on the east coast were in rapid decline. And that kind of contrasted a lot with where I live, because in on the south coast of Australia, um, koala populations are booming. And in actual fact, in the area I live in, they're so abundant that they even overbrowse the trees um, and are in danger of eating out their food supply. So there's kind of this anomaly, and I was really curious to know, well, how's that happening and what's actually going on with koalas? Um, and to try and uncover that, um, I thought that, it, you know, it would be a good thing to explore. And the more I looked into koalas, the the less I realised I actually knew about them, you know. Our superficial understanding of koalas is actually just that, quite superficial. So there's a lot more to learn about koalas. So I thought we'd run this session today by exploring a few of the myths, the common myths and misconceptions about koalas that lots of people have. So um, I'll just run through a, a few of those and we'll see where it takes us. So myth number one is obviously that koalas are bears and Related to that is the drop bear mythology. I'm sure you've all heard this classic story about drop bears in Australia. It's a favourite story for Australians to tell visiting tourists to assure them that if they camp under a tree, they've got to be really careful because this ferocious drop bear will drop on them and, and do them huge damage. Now, this is a, a joke, <laughs> obviously. Um, Australians love to convince people that uh, Australia is a really dangerous place full of um, um, po poisonous snakes and um, deadly sharks and deadly crocodiles and spiders, huge spiders. And, and you know, look, all of those things are true. But frankly, um, you know, you guys come from a country full of big cats and, and um, bears. So I don't know what you're worried about. A few little snakes and spiders are nothing to worry about. Um, and you certainly don't have to worry about drop bears. I think it's a bit of an ironic joke, that one, because koalas are actually quite affable and amiable animals by and large, so they're very rarely aggressive. Um, they, not to say that they can't be, but um, they, they generally aren't a problem. They're generally pretty good-natured. So don't panic about the drop bears. And, of course, they're not bears. They're not bears at all. They're marsupials, um, like a lot of Australian animals. Um, so they give birth to tiny, tiny little um, jelly bean young um, and the jelly bean young climb up the mother's fur and into a pouch and they spend the next few months um, growing larger in the pouch. So they kind of have a two-stage birth process. I have to say as a mother I think this is a really good method and I feel like we've missed out a little, little bit not having a marsupial breeding system. Um, so. So the the, ba the joeys, all, mars all marsupial babies are called joeys. Um, they grow inside the pouch and then they have a second birth when they're big enough to emerge into the outside world. And that's kind of the developmental stage that most um, placental or eutherian mammals give birth at. So, um, so yeah, they're not bears. <laughs> I think that just came about because they look a bit like teddy bears. When Europeans first came across koalas, though, they were really confused by what they were. Um, they were commonly called sloths or monkeys or bears. 
So um, Europeans had a great deal of difficulty identifying what they were. And as you can see from these early European pictures, you know, they look more like guinea pigs or, or strange looking cats with funny feet. Um, the earliest taxidermy um, a, a koala that went overseas to Europe, you can see in the, in the bottom left corner. Um, and it's a very strange looking beast indeed. And I have to say that a lot of taxidermy koalas remain very strange looking beasts. Uh, so be wary of what you see in museums um, overseas or, you know, in the, aren't in Australia, I guess. So, so they, they, you know, I think it took a long time before Europeans really worked out what koalas were and, and how they operated. So, um, yeah, and I guess part of that comes from the, the whole marsupial thing because marsupials are, are a bit strange to Northern Hemisphere eyes. So I guess... The second myth I'd like to talk about is that marsupials are a bit boring. <laughs> and also, this is actually something Australians suffer from as well, this myth. I think the issue with marsupials is that the Northern Hemisphere is not very familiar with the diversity of marsupials. I remember I had a very good friend staying with me um, from um, the US and I asked her if she would live in a bush area and we have lots of possum boxes. So we put up possum boxes in the trees because a lot of our mammals are hollow dwelling animals. They like to live in tree hollows. And I said, do you want to see what's in the possum box? You know, pop a ladder up and have a look, see if there's a possum. And she went, oh, possums, they're so ugly. <laughs> she says, we've got possums, I don't want to see them. And when I, I thought that's a strange thing to say. But of course, she's referring to the Virginia opossum which is the one that's known uh, across North America. But, you know, there's a lot a, a lot more to an opossum even than just the Virginia opossum. So if we look at the um, South American opossums, which I just finished reading this fabulous book on opossums. Um, so if you want to know more about um, Virginia uh, opossum, South American opossums, you should have a look in that book. And there's actually, you know, 124 different species of South American opossums. So they're really quite a diverse family. Um, but there's 251 species of uh, marsupials in Australia. So, so the, the family of marsupials is really, really diverse in Australia. And I think that's what makes them so amazingly interesting from a scientific point of view. Because they're all in the one place, um, they tend to be ignored a little bit uh, by science. Um, they're hard to get to for a start. <laughs> But the thing is that there's such an amazing opportunity because everything we look at look at in mammals, you know, when we're looking at life history traits, if we're looking at, you know, why animals are adopting a particular life life approach, you know, whether it's, you know, eating leaves or or living in trees or whether they're nocturnal or diet or whatever it is, we're only looking at one branch of the tree when we look at Etherian mammals alone, the Northern Hemisphere, the minute you put a marsupial into that equation, you're massively increasing the power of that analysis because you've got a completely evolutionary distinct line in there. Of course, you could also pop a monotreme in there, but the platypuses and the echidnas are a very small group. Um, but, you know, and the other, the other reason that marsupials are great is because they they're biologically very diverse. So ecologically and physiologically, they take a huge range. We have the marsupial moles, we have the kangaroos, which are, which are huge and very distinctive. And if we include also the prehistoric marsupials, we've got things like giant diprotodons, which were two to three tons. Um, so, you know, we can have woolly mammoths, but we had these giant, you could call them wombat, like they're not really wombats. But just to give you an idea of the scale, this is this is a koala jaw, and they have these classic front front teeth, which is what gives them their name, the diprotodon family. And if I put a cast of a diprotodon teeth, that's the, the scale. So those little front teeth there are translating into this this fossil um, diprotodon teeth. So they're huge beasts. So they're really diverse and interesting family. I could talk about them forever, but we'll stick to koalas. So perhaps we'll move on to uh, our myth number three. So this one is that koalas are stoners. I don't know if you've ever heard this myth before, but it's quite widespread that they're a bit doped out and, and sleepy all the time. 
So people have this idea that they get that from the eucalypts, that the eucalypt gum, gum leaves that they exclusively feed on um, have some kind of psychotropic drug in them and it makes them dopey. Well, yeah, I'm sure you've got an expression, there's something about don't poke a sleeping bear. Yeah, well, you shouldn't poke a sleeping koala either because you'll soon find it's not stoned. Um, it's actually very alert and probably quite upset with you. So um, that said, while koalas are not stoned, they do sleep an awful lot. Um, and I think sometimes this has given them a bit of a bad reputation as well. Um, but, the, you know, they, they say, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons why they think they might um, sleep for a long time. But they do sleep for up to 95% of the time. I'm not sure that's very different from, you know, my cat or my dog. They, they sleep most of the time. So we don't tend to think they're, um, you know, stoners or, or, or stupid because of it. But um, so, and I guess the other thing is we don't see koalas moving very much in the wild either because they're more active at night. Um, they do, they will be active during the daytime sometimes, but more commonly at night. So they're just not active when we're looking at them, which is why it's a really good idea to go and see them in the zoo because at least they're easy to spot there. So eucalyptus is not a drug. Um, it is a toxin, so it is a bit poisonous. Um, and koalas need to have a very special way of dealing with the toxins in eucalypts. Um, and the way they do that is with a supercharged liver. So they have this amazing liver that's incredibly good at getting toxins out of their food. And it's so good at doing this that it's also extremely good at removing medicines from their system. So this means, for example, that when koalas are suffering from chlamydia, which is a common disease in koalas and quite a problem for them, um, you know, if a human was suffering from chlamydia, it would take three days of drugs to clear that infection. For a koala, that would take a month of drugs. So um, that's, that's a big problem for the koalas. Um, but it's really good for helping them eat their food. Okay, if we can move on to myth four. Associated with that idea of, you know, the koalas being um, sleepy is, is the idea that they're a bit stupid. And, and this has been ex uh, expanded upon by old research papers which claimed that they, their brains only occupied 60% of the skull cavity, which, it, which is a strange thing to say if you, if you know anything about brains. They typically fill the space available, and if you don't need a big brain, you have a smaller skull. But um, nonetheless, this is a prevailing myth um, that the koala brains sort of rattle around in their empty heads. <laughs> I think this comes from the fact that um, early researchers were looking at pickled koalas. So they were looking at koalas that had been preserved in alcohol or, or some other preservative, and the brains tissue had shrunk. So when we look at freshly autopsied koalas, we see that the brain actually fills the cavity space the same as it does in any other mammal. And that's been confirmed by MRI studies of living koalas now. So it is a complete myth. So we can say that one's completely busted. And if we look at brain size generally for koalas and look at the comparative analysis, we find that koalas have a typical or normal average brain size for a mammal of their size. So there's, there's nothing substandard about a koala brain. This is not to say they're exceptionally smart animals, but they're, not, they have, they're certainly not small-brained either. Um, and I guess this also ties in with that idea that, you know, um, marsupials are a bit substandard, um, which, which is actually something quite common that um, it does pop up in colonial literature a lot. Uh, it was certainly a feature in North America. There was an idea that the... The animals in North America, when Europeans first moved there, were seen as somehow degenerate or primitive or declining, not as good as the old world animals. And the same sort of pattern happens in Australia as well, where Australian animals are seen as not quite as good as mammals from, from other areas. So it's a bias that we obviously have to be aware of. Um, but, yeah, there's nothing wrong with their brains. And marsupials, in fact, don't have smaller brains than um than other mammals. They do have different brains, so they don't have a corpus callosum. So they don't have that thick nerve fiber stretching between the two hemispheres of the brain. They seem to use the old base part of the brain to connect the hemispheres instead. 
So they just have a different way of doing things. We should know by now that just because something's got a small brain doesn't mean it's not smart either. The birds have definitely proven that that's not the case. So, um, yeah, koala brains are just fine. The only thing, you know, the interesting thing when you look at that comparative stuff on brain size that you see is that it's primates that are out on the edge. They're the ones that are unusual. We've got a really unusual, and humans are on the edge for primates. So we do have oversized brains for our body size, um, but we shouldn't necessarily judge all the other animals on that. So you're looking at um, the next myth, myth number four is the myth that koalas don't need to drink. How does this hold up? Now, koala, the word koala actually comes from a Darak word, which means no drink. So it's an indigenous word for, for, an, for an animal that doesn't drink very much. Um, and that, that actually comes from probably the original word was galawan or gala. Um, and if you, if you, you, know, you can see how that would be translated into koala, you know, gala, koala, koala wine, koala wine, the, the g and the k translate over and then it becomes more easily said as koala, koala. So that's the origin of the word. And it's true that koalas are quite drought adapted and that they don't often, they're not often seen drinking, but it's not to say they don't drink. They, they get a lot of water from the trees that they're feeding on, but they are quite associated with, with water and they will certainly we've seen all seen i'm sure pictures of koalas um being in a bushfire situation being fed you know or being given a bottle of water um by firefighters and drink bottles and they you know they hold the drink bottle up we, we now get a lot of messaging don't give koalas drink bottles because they're not supposed to drink like this they're meant to lap from a bowl um, and it's much safer for them. They're less likely to get chest infections and things like that. So this is a photo of a friend of mine, Elaine Webster, who, who loves her koalas. And this is a koala she just came across in a park and it looked a bit hot. So she offered it a bowl of water and the koala said, yes, thanks, I'll have a bit of that. So this is what I mean by koalas being, generally speaking, fairly amiable, especially if, if they want something from you. The interesting thing about water and koalas, though, is that... Um, if we look at their distribution now, you know, eucalypt forests are drought adapted and certainly have done well because of their adaptations to drought. But the particular eucalypt trees that koalas like to live in are um, tend to be the ones associated with wetter areas. So things like river red gums that are spread along the river systems um, and uh, blue gums, which are known for growing in swampy areas. And so th there's a distinct feature of koala feed trees that suggests they have a prehistory associated with water. We also find that all their fossils are found in areas, now they're found in the desert, but in the past when the koalas lived there, they were swampy forests. So they were, they were inland lake areas. Now that of course increases the chance of fossilization. But nonetheless, it does seem that there's an association between those swampy forests and koala evolution and distribution. And if we look at their distribution today in, in sort of in a narrower time scale, we find that koalas do well when it's not a drought season. So in droughts, they decline and in um, wet years, they increase. And Australia's got a very oscillating climate. So we'll have 10 or 20 years of wet and then 10 or 20 years of drought. So um, it's not a seasonal or an annual kind of cycle. So they definitely are associated with water and their distribution is, is very strongly linked to the amount of standing water available. So dams, lakes, rivers, that sort of thing. So surprisingly, they, they, they don't drink much, but water is important to them. All right, if we can move on to the next slide, we're on to... Um, whether or not koalas are sociable. So this is, a, <laughs> this is an interesting question. Koalas are typically regarded as being solitary and, and that would be how we'd mostly describe them um, as biologists, they're usually found on their own. The issue of whether they're, they're sociable or not is a slightly different question though, I think. You know, as you can see from this picture, this is taken in Lone Pine Sanctuary in Brisbane. There are there are three female koalas in this photo and three joeys. And actually, this is part of a video I took while I was visiting there. And that koala in the middle is just about to climb up on top of the koala on the right 
and sit on her and push her out of her perch, which is <laughs> quite an interesting interaction. But it was all done fairly amicably, um, if sitting on someone's head is amicable. But um, the point is that they will often sit together in those environments. And then when they're in captivity like this, uh, I guess the, the interesting thing is that they're not looking for food. Food is being provided to them. So there's no sh food shortage. So I think they're solitary because they have to disperse through their environment in order to get enough food. And koalas do need really big forests in order to get enough food. Um, one koala, on average, one koala needs an area of forest the size of an average sports field um, in order to get enough food. So, you know, they're a pretty high demand animal. And in really arid forests, they can actually, you can have as few as one koala per an area the size of New York Central Park. So, which is quite extraordinary. <laughs> so, yes, they are normally really widely dispersed. But except for the breeding season, they're generally, they're not. They're not um, unsociable, so they, they'll happily associate with each other. The, the issue about breeding is a bit different. They do get a little bit cranky then. So, um, but, you know, that's understandable. Okay, if we could move on to the next slide, and we'll go to our next myth, which is um, that they're slow because their diet isn't very nutritious. So this all ties into that whole thing about koalas being slow and stupid, um, which, which is quite pervasive. And, and it ties into, the, the, you know, the, the blame for that is attributed to, to them eating eucalypts. And, and, you know, I guess the thing is that with an animal like a koala, it's a bit like pandas where we say, you know, they're a bit slow and stupid and, and they're bound to be going to go extinct. You know, they're, they're inherently going to go extinct because they've made bad life choices. Um, you know, they eat eucalypts, which taste terrible. So, so they're, they're, you know, on the way out, which, which I think is a worrying narrative because I don't think it's true. Of course, it makes no sense to say an animal's maladapted. If, it, if it's around, it's clearly very well adapted to its environment. It's, it can't be anything else. And eucalypts are not particularly lacking nutrition. They're certainly hard to digest, but they don't lack nutrition. A koala eats about the same amount um, of gum leaves as a grazing animal that feeds on grass does of the same size. So, so they're clearly getting the same nutritional value out of the same amount of gum leaves as you get out of grass. Now, grass is not a very nutritional nutrition nutritional food either. <laughs> Nutritious, that's the word. Um, but the difference is that that gum leaves are, as I've mentioned before, hugely toxic. So the issue of nutrition in plants, of course, is that we don't have very good stomachs for extracting the nutrition out of leaf matter and cellulose that, that is in, the, in, the, in the, the leaves and the plant material. So high fibre diets require a very special type of um, digestive system to break down. And a lot of herbivores have those really complex um, stomachs that, that you know, we know all about. Um, from our grazing animals. And koalas are no different. They, uh, they also have very complex stomachs, just different sort of stomachs. So what koalas have is a very enlarged, what in us is the appendix. So our appendix is the size, you know, about the size of the thumb. So just a little nub, there's nothing much to it. And it doesn't appear to do a huge amount. But in koalas, that's the cecum and it's two metres long. So, you know, it's, it's a really big structure and it seems that that contains a microbial soup that helps the, the koala to digest the eucalypts in this microbial um, stew that it keeps in, in its cecum for quite some time before that passes through the rest of its digestive system. So, that, so that's the, the secret is it, to the koala's success is their, um, their, their microbial biome, which is very distinct and specific to the trees that they are living in. So when we say koalas are adapted to eating um, gum leaves, I think we often think it's one type of tree, you know, eucalypts, 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 they all look the same. Well, you know, they do actually look very different. I mean, I've got a couple here that I just picked from my garden and you can see you know, the, the difference between these two eucalypts and just in terms of the superficial appearance of the of the leaves. Um, so there are eight or nine hundred types of um, species of 
eucalyptry in Australia and most of them are restricted to, you know, they come from Australia. It's the heartland of eucalypt um, evolution. And of those, koalas eat about 70 species. But each individual koala will only eat, say, between four and ten species and possibly mostly only prefer one or two of those. So, so they can be quite specific, which is, which is really interesting because you end up with koalas being individually specialised, but as a species, they're a generalist because they actually have quite a wide range of food that they eat. Um, and the secret of that success, that enables them to be distributed through all the forests across Australia. So they've been able to exploit the eucalypt forest, which is a dominant Australian forest, and they can exploit all of them, not just a bit of them. Um, and the way they do that is not by changing themselves as a species, but by having variable gut biomes. So they've changed the microbes in their system. Um, and how they do that is, a, is, a, is a, a bit of a mystery that we're still working on. All right, so if we can move on to the next myth, I did want to talk a little bit about their hands. I don't know if you've heard this story that koalas have fingerprints, and this one is true. They do have fingerprints, and they're one of the few animals outside of the primates to have fingerprints. It's said that if you find a koala fingerprint at a crime scene, they would assume it was a person. I don't know that anybody's ever tested that, but... That's the, that's the story, which is, it's a really interesting feature. I should also note from this, you'll see they have very, very strange hands. They have two thumbs on their hands and one thumb on their foot. You'll also see that on their foot, one of the toes is joined together um, and it's got two claws on it. And that, that two clawed toe is often used for grooming. Um, this, is, this is called syndactyly and it's actually quite a common feature in marsupials. So um, it, it's not unusual for the, just to the koalas. Their hands are really quite interesting because they're very long and grippy and very um, capable of grabbing leaves. You see them, they, they eat when they handle their food. They're, despite the fact that their hands are quite strange, they also look quite human in a way, except for those great big long claws, which is exactly why you shouldn't poke a sleeping koala because those claws are razor sharp. Um, a friend of mine who works with koalas said that they are just like razor blades. She said, it's okay, though. They heal up really quickly because they're so clean <laughs> with their cut. And I guess they're, they're, they're nicely disinfected with eucalyptus as well. <laughs> so, so they're clean in that sense as well. Um, nobody's really sure why koalas have fingerprints. I suspect it's just a, um, it's, it's just a, a side effect of the way of having a bare finger like that, that the skin develops in those whorls through some sort of developmental process. I'm not entirely convinced that it's a has any adaptive advantage. People think that, well, perhaps it's to do with grip, but fingerprints don't actually improve grip. They, they arguably, when people have actually looked at it, they can actually make it more slippery because liquid um, sits in the gap gaps and, and makes your finger slide. Um, if you were having good grip, you'd have big ridges and, and a lot of animals that need grip on their hands will actually have, you know, like big ridge, heavy ridges across their, their paws. So another argument though is that it actually increases tactile sensitivity. Um, and of course we know that our fingers are incredibly sensitive and, and part of that is because of the way um, the skin vibrates when we, when we touch. It, and it um, activates the cells underneath. And it's possible that that's an issue for koalas. You know, you'd think that they possibly they do need very deep, you know, very fine tuned touch, whether that's for climbing trees and making sure they hang on or, or whether it's something to do with selecting the leaves. Nobody really knows. So, that, so that's something that remains a little bit of a mystery. So if we can move on to myth, what are we up to? Number nine. Um, just to really nail that issue about the myth that koalas are maladapted and doomed to extinction, I think we can really knock this on the head if we look at their prehistory and see how widely distributed they were. So um, you can see from this map that koala fossils were found right across the southwest, from the southwestern tip of Australia, right across the um, southern coast and right up inland east coast of Australia so and this really maps onto the old forest before Australia went through its current 
um, drying phase when the inland of Australia was quite wet. Um, we had a lot of koalas all through that area. And as the forests retreat, have retreated, you know, in those um, Pleistocene oscillations of, of climate that have happened in Australia, the, the forests have shrunk and the koalas have, have reduced their range at the same time. And of course, in the last 200 years, they've had the added burden of um, European colonisation and settlement in Australia and the loss of a large part of the forest estate that they previously occupied. So this distribution is continuing to shrink um, into the forested heartland on the east coast, which also happens to conflict with um, the major Australian population centres. So we have the cities growing out into the forests and the koalas retreating in and it's usually the koalas that lose. I have to say though that over their past, you know, koalas have demonstrated that they've been incredibly resilient and successful survivors. Um, they've survived two major extinction events before. One was the Pleistocene um, mass extinction which wiped out you know, the Ice Age fauna, the mammoths and all those sorts of things. And it also in Australia wiped out the Diprotodons and Silacaleos and all those other amazing um, megafaunal Australian animals. Um, and koalas suffered a massive genetic bottleneck. We can see it in their, their genes, um, but they've bounced back from that. They, they came back. And then when Europeans settled, they were almost hunted to extinction. So they were hunted for the fur trade and most of the fur was shipped to um, America and, and to the UK. There was a, a really insatiable demand for, I don't know, gloves and muffs and coats and hats and things like that and rugs. Um, and they were declared extinct in the southern state of Victoria, so down the bottom and in South Australia where I live. Um, and they've recovered from, from that once, once hunting was actually, the thing that stopped hunting in Australia was actually um, Herbert Hoover banned the import of koala fur into America. That dried up the market and the hunting stopped. So thank you for that. Um, but amazingly, the koalas have bounced back. So from a very small population that was popped on an island to try and save them from bushfires, and other threats in Victoria, that population has boomed and been translocated back onto the mainland. And, and now most of the booming southern population is descended from that one small group. So they are incredibly resilient um, and, and you know, hugely successful. So if we can move on to our next slide. I guess the next question is where to from here for koalas? They are obviously declining on the East Coast and the issue there is that they're not declining to the extent that we would normally consider an animal endangered. They're not down to the last 200 animals or anything like that, but they're declining rapidly. And it's the speed of that decline that has people really worried. And the East Coast koalas are what we call the Northern population um, are suffering from a whole heap of different factors. So not only have they lost a lot of their forests, the remaining forests are fragmented. Um, they're being, dis those forests are disproportionately impacted by bushfires. They still have land clearance going on in those states. Um, so they're still losing forests in their, those areas. Um, and also the native forests are being logged, which whilst that doesn't destroy the forest, it changes the forest and actually decreases the amount of koala food available and increases the number of inedible eucalypts. So that's causing a major problem. We've also got increased population pressure from humans, more cars, more dogs, more roads. Um, so all of those things are causing problems for the koalas. And also there's a lot of disease on the East Coast, which may be a symptom of the habitat problems, but they suffer from chlamydia, as well as an AIDS-like koala retrovirus, which is moving through the population. Koalas can probably cope with all of those things, just not all at once. Um, so I think that's the problem, is that the, the decline in koalas is telling us that the world is seriously out of balance for them and something needs to be done to, to, to look after their country and, and protect their forests, which will also protect the forests for all the other animals that depend on those ecosystems. And of course, it makes it a better place for us as well. 
So I guess that's my take home message is the importance of protecting and expanding koala forests, not just not just retaining what we've got, but we actually need to be looking at restoring them and expanding them if we're not going to lose more species, which I'm sure you probably know Australia holds one of the records for the most number of mammalian extinctions, um, which is probably um, a factor to do with the more recent colonisation of Australia than other countries and the fact that we're an island continent and we have a highly distinctive and, and vulnerable population of, of species, as well as just being bad at looking after them. So that's the take-home message from me. Um, and, you know, I, I think we'd probably be, it's a good time now if we can pass over to um, some questions. As was mentioned, my book, which was available, if we can just go to the next slide, there's two editions available. One's the Australian edition and one's the American edition. So don't be confused by that. Um, they're both the same book. Um, and I hope you enjoy them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, and I'm sort of uh, fumbling around here because I have one of those sleepy kittens right on my lap right now <laughs> as I'm trying to organize things. So when you um, can't move. No, and um, she's definitely very smart. So, oh, now she's getting up. Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, thank you. We have a bunch of questions and um, I have some questions um, and I'm going to ask a question from myself at about age eight, which is how furry fuzzy are koalas? Are they soft or are they not? Yeah, look, I mean, technically people will say that their fur is a little bit coarse, but it's very thick and and they're lovely, squishy, squishy things, <laughs> especially the southern koalas. So southern koalas, because they, they live in a colder area, their, their fur is much thicker. Um, the northern koalas that live up in the tropics, they tend to have thinner fur. But yeah, no, they're, they're, they're lovely. And those fluffy ears, they're just, they're just so lovely. They look at, they look and they feel as cute as they look. I'm, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I need to go <laughs> hug a koala, I think. Um, <laughs> um, I had a question about their distinctive nose shape. Is there, just talking about just kind of general body um, morphology, What what, is there any kind of indication as why their noses look like that or do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, marsupials don't sweat, apparently. So um, but losing body heat is quite, there's quite a few different different things about marsupials. They don't molt, so they don't shed their fur seasonally the way um, placental mammals do, probably because Australia just doesn't have such strong seasonal um, patterns. We do have seasons, but they're not as strong. So, um, yeah, they, they do suffer from heat trying to work out how to lose the, the heat from their body. So noses are probably an important thing of doing that. The big ears are also a way of losing losing heat. Um, and in hot weather, as you saw from the from the earlier pictures of the koalas, those ones were taken in Queensland when it was quite hot and they just splay out everywhere all over the trees. They use the tree trunks as a sort of a cool heat because the trees are a bit cooler. So they will frequently sort of slide against the trunk of a tree and just lie on the cool side and and they'll often come and sit in it if you have a tub of water on your lawn where koalas come they will come and sit in it <laughs> to cool down so yeah they do, they do have a heat problem and I think that's what the nose probably is about but they also use it for greeting each other so they oh. they bop, bop noses with each other oh. which is really cute it sounds like it <laughs> <laughs> Um, you mentioned that there are different um, populations and, and there was the, the one that was put on the island for a while. And are they different species or are they all one species? No, no, they're all one species. It's been a big matter of debate because we used to be, they used to be described as having three species. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen, you, a map of Australia is a bit like a map of America. You've got these, you know, really straight lines around state borders and a couple of wiggly ones. But the, the species remarkably adhered to those perfectly straight lines on the map, <laughs> which biologically makes no sense. So, yeah, they used to have a different species in each state. But, um, they, you know, modern science has shown that they're all one population. There are some genetic variations, but they interbreed perfectly happily right across the range. 
speaking of interbreeding, you were saying that there can be one koala in the size of, you know, a football field or a, or Central Park or, or something like that. How do they find each other? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they do range around quite a bit. Um, they use chemical signaling, so they mark the trees. Um, so, you know, I, I dare say that chemical communication is quite important for them to both find each other and also avoid each other when they, you know, want to avoid a, a big male or something like that. But they also bellow. So koalas have a very distinctive bellowing call, which I always describe as is imagine if you pretend to be a donkey and you make that donkey donkey noise and then you drop your voice as low as you possibly can and do it as slowly as you can. That's what a koala sounds like. So, <laughs> and, and they respond, you can hear that from a long way through the forest and, and they will respond to anything else that sounds like that. So a, a jet plane flying over or a chainsaw or a car backfiring is often enough to set off the male koalas in the area and they'll have a little bellow at each other. So I think that's how they find each other. Yeah. I was really surprised when I heard what koalas sound like. I want to say I could be making this up that they used some recording of a koala to the dinosaur noise and Jurassic park or something (laughs) like that. It's it's not the most attractive noise in the world. (laughs) Um, so you were talking about, um, how, uh, the, as a species, they are generalists, but each individual koala can have its own preferences. And I'm wondering if you put, um, if you relocate one to a zoo or a, relocate a group to a zoo, do you have to go out and get all the different kinds of trees or, or how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. That makes koalas one of the most expensive animals to keep in captivity overseas, particularly when they're overseas. And it's probably one of the reasons why the first successful colonies to breed overseas were in San Diego, because San Diego already had a fairly good array of eucalypt trees, you know, because they had been planted as street trees in the area. So they had quite a lot of eucalypts already. And they now have a huge plantation of eucalypts of different species to feed their koalas. So you need a monster amount of eucalypts to, to feed koalas. Because it's not just that they're specialist on the particular species of tree, they will always also be fussy about which individual tree from that species and which leaves from that tree so not all leaves from that tree are are okay for a koala and then suddenly they'll change their mind and decide they don't want that one anymore they want something else so nobody really knows what is the right food for a koala except the koala so you just have to give it lots and lots of feed and let it choose for itself and that was one of the problems with moving them to new locations or to overseas is that they would they would eat what you gave them but they would end up just sickening and dying because it just wasn't right. So, yeah. I've also heard that they will only eat off of a tree. Like if you put it on a plate or something that they won't eat that, or is that not true? Yeah. I've got (laughs) different people will say different things. You uh, some people will say, you know, some keepers will say you can just shove some leaves in front of them and they'll pick them up and eat them quite happily. Um, so, so I'm not entirely sure about that. I think that might depend on the koala. Mm-hmm. Um, so do koalas interact with any other species? Obviously, they, they often have some space from each other, but are they, do they inter- interact with any other kinds of animals? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I, I just... You know, I don't, I don't know that people particularly look at that in great detail, their interactions with other animals. They do interact with other animals, though. Um, you know, I've, I've been told about them, you know, reaching out and, and touching a horse on the, on the face, you know, because horses are quite curious. Young koalas are curious um, and they will often come and explore. They will sometimes come and approach humans as well. Um, so... So, yeah, they, they do seem to be a bit curious. They're not particularly frightened animals. They, they'll often move away from people, um, and certainly if they're dogs around, but um, they're not particularly afraid of other things. I, I, they're not, I think they don't have a lot of predators um, other than dogs. Um, so, so, you know, they don't, they don't have a flight response. They, don't run, they can't run away. The, the only thing they can do is go up a tree. So, 
Mm -hmm. They're not particularly, and once they're up a tree, they're happy to sit and look at you and and stay quite close because they know they're safe there. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more about their bodies. Um, I've, I've heard tell before, and you also mentioned um, the, the chlamydia issues with them. And I'm wondering how chlamydia manifests in a koala, what, what happens to them? Yeah, yeah. Look, it's, it's really an awful condition. They end up with very swollen and inflamed eyes. They will go blind. Um, so they get these pink, pink eye, re- weeping eyes. Um, they end up with an, uh, an inflamed, you know, a, a wet bottom. So, so that that all ends up really inflamed and wet, so much so that they, it's quite painful. They will cry from the pain, um, and and it's it's awful. It's it's a horrible disease. It it makes them um, infertile eventually, um, but in the meantime, they transmit it to their young. So, um, and of course, the retroviruses you know, like AIDS does in humans, it makes those diseases worse. So there's evidence that, the you know, some of the koalas, the southern koalas didn't have the heavy chlamydia burden and there are some populations that are disease-free. Um, but even in the populations that have got chlamydia, they don't seem to manifest the same symptoms. So they don't seem to get as sick. And I'm guessing that's because of the retrovirus. So it's a bit of an intersection. So on to hopefully a, a slightly happier topic. Um, talk about how they they breed. How long do they gestate? Um, do they have many babies? How how talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well they 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 typically only have one um, joey at a time, but they can have twins. So on occasion you will see them with twins. I guess the thing you know, koala breeding is quite slow. It takes their their milk is quite weak, so they lactate for a long time and they have to raise their young for for quite a long time. With marsupials, you know, they seem they seem to take a long time, but really you have to divide that by the stage in the pouch versus the stage outside. So so they, you know, if you if you add pregnancy in you get a more accurate (laughs) assessment of the length of gestation so it's not that you know gestation is not really the same thing in marsupials as it is in eutherian mammals um but yeah they they go through that really important phase where they're they're just feeding on milk and joeys at that stage will have a bit of a play around with leaves but they don't eat them there's that sort of say they'll be interested in them but they just don't chew on them and, and swallow them at all and it's not until um, the mother at some point goes through a very particular weaning process, which is perhaps one of possibly one of the most revolting things with koalas. <laughs> I'm aware <laughs> of this. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they actually eject the contents of their cecum. So the, the cecum, which I said, contains this microbial soup. It's a bright green goop. <laughs> and the mother will, will eject this and the baby eats it. Um, And this inoculates the baby with the microbes that it needs to digest gum leaves. So it's, it's, it's voracious. They, they love this stuff. (laughs) I'm guessing there's a lot of people saying, ew, right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. (laughs) It's a very messy process. (laughs) But that means that the baby koalas get the special inoculation they need to eat the leaves that their mother's been eating. So they know that, you know, that that's going to make them able to eat the trees around them. And as soon as they've done that, they start eating leaves and, and moving off their milk diet. So it's a really important process. Um, and it's not unique to koalas. I mean, that so koalas do it very dramatically, but humans also have a fecal inoculation through the birth process that is important for gut bacteria. And we're increasingly realising how important gut bacteria is to our own health. So, so this is just a more dramatic form of that. Yeah, it feels so much more intentional too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but who am I to judge, right? Um, <laughs> so you were saying that the, the appendix is two meters long. Is, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we don't really have a, hardly a cecum at all. We just have what we call the appendage of the cecum, which is the appendix. So mm-hmm. it's just a little nubby bit on the end, whereas they've got the whole thing. So it's one of the longest um, cecums in the animal kingdom. I think there's a, there's the AI has a longer one, but mm-hmm. apart from that, so it's pretty remarkable. So obviously, you know, we as humans have 23 feet of, of 
you know, intestines or whatever. And, and but I, I'm wondering how big actually are our koalas and, and just in terms of weight or I, I guess I've seen pictures of them, but are they, um, that, that seems like a lot to fit in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're not that, they're not that big. So the Northern koalas are around six to eight kilos. Um, and the Southern koalas are, you know, range like eight to eight to 12 kilos. So they're, they're a bit bigger. Um, so, you know, you, you could, if you, if you, they're about the size of a, you know, three-year-old or something, I guess. So, hmm. Hmm. Um, and, uh, so, so many questions, um, <laughs> and I don't want to, to drag on for too long, but one of the things that you had mentioned was, um, going underground to find out more about koalas. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, well, that seems like a strange thing to do when you're talking about a completely arboreal animal that lives up the trees. I did also do some tree climbing, but, but I went underground because I wanted to find out about the fossil history of koalas. And um, I was going underground to look for the fossils of the giant koala, which lived actually quite close to where I live, so just over, over the gulf on the other peninsula. There's a cave where these fossils were found. Now, I, I couldn't go to the place where the fossils were because that's like a two-hour climb, but I really did want to know what cavers went through and, and how they had discovered these fossils, and it was a, certainly a real eye-opening experience for me. I'm, I'm sure cavers would think it was it was just a walk in the park, but for me, crawling through these little rabbit holes um, for hours on end in the dark was a pretty amazing experience, and I have a whole new respect for cavers finding fossils now. Um, but it also actually gave me a great insight into the into the environment of the of the koalas and where they had been because those particular caves I looked in were um, caves that had been dissolved by the underground water table and that made me think about the water table and how it had once been higher and how it had once been you know the land above me is quite dry and arid but in the past it had been quite swampy and forested so you know the, that whole experience helped me really understand those prehist prehistoric environments and, um, you know it gets you away from the what you can see on the top of the world and thinks about what's underneath and what's going on in the past um i don't know if you can hear one of my other cats is um has some things to say about me <laughs> but anyway <laughs> um so there's a, a question um actually one of our volunteers may be the one who asked about this um the students that rescued uh the koala off the tree with their canoe uh recent news she'll know um was that foolhardy or genius oh um in terms of rescuing koalas koalas you know, koalas can be dangerous, so you know you could do have to be careful of those super sharp claws. But they are they will also come and solicit help from people if they need it. They will come and and look for water. Um, they will look for assistance from humans. Then then they're not you know it's it's not impossible that that happens. And that particular koala, that was a perfectly safe thing to do. Koalas are not particularly aggressive unless you stand in front of them and stop them going where they want to go so so that particular rescue where they swung the canoe around um that was a great thing to do and I think I was really interested in watching that video which you can see on YouTube um because the koala clearly comes down anticipates the movement of the canoe to the tree it's in it's in a flooded tree so the water's all around it and it hops into the canoe and as the canoe is swinging around towards the land the koala walks up the other end of the canoe so it can hop off the other end it just it's an interesting bit of anticipatory behavior where the koala is anticipating what the other animals are going to do <laughs> and where other things are going to move to, which if you think about where koalas live in trees, they will be constantly thinking about, well, if that animal comes up that tree, can it get to me? You know, so that kind of cognitive mapping has to be going on. Um, so I think that there's a lot of interesting things going on in the koala's head that we haven't given them a lot of credit for because they're slow and not that active. So, and we're hyperactive constantly fiddling climbing doing things primates so they're very different from us but but i, th I think that there's more to them than meets the eye um there was a a robust chat in our our volunteer um slack channel about uh having a 
uh, private eye koala, uh, something with the, 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 um, the fingerprints, you know, trying to <laughs> solve crimes or, or be involved in crime. Anyway. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. It was a bit ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> koala. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So um, just a couple more questions. Um, how how do Australians in general perceive koalas? Do they like them? Are they excited by them? Or are they just bored? Or Look, I, I think most people like koalas. They, they do get a little bit of negative flack. You know, they, like I said, the drop bear is a myth, but they will on occasion drop things on you. Um, and, and my daughter holds a lifelong grudge against the koala that weed on her piece of cake when she was out camping. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and koala weed, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, you don't want to get koala wee on you. It's apparently really hard to get out of your clothes. <laughs> and your cake, apparently. <laughs> yeah, and your cake. <laughs> so, you know, there are some negatives around that. I guess, you know, there is a conflict between koalas and forestry. Um, you know, obviously, if you want to cut down trees, koalas don't like that. And, uh, you know, people who like koalas don't like that. And, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, so that's a debate. Um, and of course, when we have, we have a lot of uh, plantations of blue gums that were, were planted so that farmers could harvest them and they have now become populated with koalas. So, and they're important habitat for them. So, so there are those sorts of land use debates going on. But I think generally koalas are, are pretty well liked. Well, good. Um, so I'm just going to finish up with one more question here and encourage, um, well, actually I'm going to, to two, two more questions. First question is um, if you could send our viewers out with one thing that you want them to know about koalas, what would that be? Sorry, I didn't prep you for I, that. I think <laughs> for me, ko ko koalas are the, uh, you know, they're the canary in the forest, as it were. They're, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're a robust, resilient species um, who, who are, which are survivors. Um, but the fact that they're doing badly says something about how we're looking after the earth. And it's a really big warning for us that if they're having a hard time, then we're not setting ourselves up very well um, and everything else is going to be suffering as well. So it's it's a really, they're, they're a great flagship species for conservation that we really do need to look after our forests and in order to keep our environment healthy for all of us. And then my final question, as I ask all of our speakers, um, why do you feel it is important for people to learn about science? Ah, well, for me, being a scientist and having having a scientific approach to looking at the world is is being is a bit like being a detective. You know, it's it's a great way of discovering things about the world. It's a critical thinking tool that helps us discover what works and what doesn't and how things how things tick. Um, and it's the thing that really attracted me to science when I got back into it at university. That was what captivated me and it captivates me still. And it's something we use in everyday life that's incredibly valuable. Absolutely. Well, um, I think with that, we are going to say thank you to our speaker, Danielle Claude, and I encourage you all to take a look at her book. Um, again, it is um, just out today here in the States, and uh, I have a, a coupon code I will be showing you here in just a moment. So thank you, Danielle. Thank you for co coming to us all the way from Australia. This has been fascinating. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, um, I am going to show a few more slides just to fit more housekeeping. Um, here is that uh, coupon code I was talking about with Broadway Books here in Portland. If you're not in Portland, they will ship it to you as well. So use the code koalas15 um, and through January 24th and you can get 15% off of the book and I strongly recommend it. Um, just a quick note about our next event. It will be in person. I do not believe we are live streaming this because of te uh, technology reasons. But if you are in the Vancouver area, I strongly encourage you to join us for Holy Crap, That's Cool. Go behind the scenes with OPB. That will be um, a week from Thursday on January 26th at 7 p.m. 
And then just wanted to say a quick thank you to um, all of our Patreon supporters. We have uh, more than 100 folks. I think we're at 101 right now. Um, I was just looking at it earlier and we've had, I don't know, almost 30 people who have been with us since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, just really want to say a big thank you to all of you who are sticking with us. Um, we couldn't do this without you. So thank you. And then finally, um, I have a cat on another cat on my shelf there. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we will be doing more events online, more events in person. Check out our website. Um, we have, I don't know, seven or eight, I think, events up there through March and April. So lots of stuff coming up. We hope you will join us. Um, thank you for purchasing tickets or donating. Um, and if you want to continue to support us at Science on Tap, um, here's some ways to do that. So thank you very much. Um, come see us next week in Vancouver. And thank you to our speaker, Dr. Danielle Claude. Have a lovely evening, everyone. <laughs>